Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Life's Black Belts. As always, I'm your host, Eric Alders. And uh, again, today I'm joined by another inspirational guest. Uh, as you know, if you've been listening to the show or if this is your first episode, welcome. Uh, but it's my goal to utilize my expertise in a lifetime of martial arts and martial arts education as a school owner and instructor. I own a, a school called the Karate Dojo in Jackson, New Jersey. Uh, to utilize my expertise in the journey of martial arts and you compare that to how life is a parallel to that as well. How our, our struggles, the adversity we have to overcome, the, the failures that we face, learning how to balance it all out, to keep getting up every day and getting out there and just trying to become the best version of yourself. So I try to utilize that opportunity as a way to have a nice conversation with the guests and figure out where they came from, what events have shaped them to become the people they are today and how they kind of figure it all out and keep it all balanced. So today I am joined by Joel Hawbaker. He is a real life leader. He's a husband. He's a father. He's an award-winning teacher. He's a soccer coach based out of Alabama, and he is the author of Inverted Leadership, uh, Lead Others Better by uh, Forgetting About Yourself, which is available on Amazon.com. And I'd like to welcome uh, our Life's Black Belt guest today, Mr. Joel Hawbaker. How are are you, sir? I'm very well. Thank you. I'm excited about being on and looking forward to our conversation and uh, again, hopefully providing some, uh, some good tips and value for your audience. Well, I appreciate uh, having you on very much. As we discussed briefly on the phone, um, we just wanted to t take an opportunity, get to know each other a little bit, discuss what your story is about and, and why you're doing what you're doing. And uh, one thing I always explain, as I did with you on the phone, is that this is an unscripted uh, interview. I, I literally have zero questions in front of me. It's going to be a live opportunity to just teach uh, and show people leading by example that it's a nice idea once in a while to put your phone down and maybe turn to the person to your right or your left and have a conversation with them and you may never uh, really truly understand how many amazing people are out there that are going through life and killing it but also having the same struggles that we do every single day often we, we take a look at social media and sometimes everyone's life looks amazing and we wonder why our life is so messed up and to you realize that we're all kind of going through the same thing whether you're first starting out or even if you're a you know world champion or even a millionaire that we all are human when we strip mm -hmm. off um, what roles we play or how cool our job may be or how many people know us, <laughs> we all kind of face the same challenges uh, throughout life as well. So that's one of the reasons I wanted to bring you on the show. And I appreciate you again taking the time out of your busy day to, to be with us. Um, I know that uh, in, in the intro, I mentioned that you are a teacher and you're based mm -hmm. out of Alabama. Are you, Correct. Are you from Alabama or did you relocate there? Why don't we start there? Um, I consider myself to be from Alabama. I was born in Georgia, uh, but I moved to Alabama when I was five or six, and I've been here for most of my life since then. So Alabama is uh, Alabama is definitely home for me. Okay. And uh, throughout your life as a child and growing up, did you spend most of your life based in the South? Did you have a, mm -hmm. a lot of opportunities growing up with your family to explore other parts of the states? Like for me personally, I'm I'm from New Jersey, um, mm -hmm. yeah, and, and I have visited the South, uh, but for only limited periods of time. So I have yeah. a little bit of, a, of an understanding of it. But how about yourself? Um, no, so we traveled some. I remember uh, I've got an aunt and uncle who used to live on Long Island, New York, and we traveled up to see them once or twice. Uh, went out to Texas with a, a baseball team many years ago. Uh, but most of my life growing up was definitely spent in the South, uh, mostly in Alabama, and then went to college in um, in Georgia, just outside Chattanooga, Tennessee. So. Um, fortunately in college is when I really was able to start sort of traveling outside the South. I spent, um, three weeks in Central America in Honduras on a mission trip with, uh, some, uh, students from my college. Uh, and then that was after my freshman year and then spring of my sophomore year, I was very blessed. I got to uh, actually study abroad at Oxford university in the UK for a semester. So that was a lot of fun and, uh, certainly opened my eyes to how much bigger the world is than, uh, than just you know, the, the town I'm from in Alabama is called Anniston and it's less than 30,000 people. So it's wow. a pretty small, yeah, it's a pretty small place. Um, and so one of the things that I try to do in my teaching is to help kids realize the world is a lot bigger than our little pocket. Our little pocket's good. There are parts of it that are great. Um, but the world's a much bigger place and it's important to learn that not everybody looks like you, talks like you, thinks like you, eats like you, believes like you. And uh, that's a good lesson to learn to help us, uh, to help us empathize with other people. 
I, I couldn't have put that any better myself. And I think, unfortunately, it's a challenge that most people face is learning how to agree to disagree and learning to understand why people think the way they do and not judge yeah. them for that, but yeah. just learn and be educated and say, oh, it's very interesting why you feel that way. I still feel my way, but right. still have a, a level of respect for one another. And I go back to martial yep. arts with that. It's taught from very early on that you might be trying to use technique to defeat this person, or we might work with a partner and have some really tough situations where, you know, it looks like you're beating each other up, but it always ends with an embrace, a hug, mm -hmm. uh, a mutual respect for one another. And uh, sometimes conversation um, can get a lot uglier and more <laughs> violent than a, a martial yeah. arts match could. Now you're, as a teacher, and we'll, we'll, we'll rewind in a moment, what subject are you currently teaching? Um, I teach uh, U.S. and world history, and I teach high school Bible as well. Okay. So are you based out of a public school or a private school? I would imagine um, teaching Bible would be a private school. It is. It's a, it's a private Christian school. It's actually about 45 minutes from where I live. Uh, so I have a pretty good commute every day. And um, so that's actually, that's, that's where I do a lot of my learning these days is in the car, um, listening to podcasts and audio books and interviews, and things like that. Um, but yeah, it is, it's a small private Christian school and it's, um, it's actually associated with um, another ministry called the Big Oak Ranch, which is a, uh, sort of a second chance home for kids. And so a lot of the kids that I teach in my classroom are kids that come from really just unimaginably, unimaginably tough backgrounds. A lot of them were um, abused or abandoned or both. And so in the same private school classroom, I've got kids who have cars that cost more than my house. And I've got other kids who, when they showed up at the ranch, had just the clothes on their back. Wow. And so it's a really interesting dynamic to get to teach both groups of kids in the same classroom and try to teach them, like you were talking about a minute ago, not everybody's like you and we need to learn how to be respectful of people who are different and not judge them because they have no money or because they have stupid amounts of money and therefore they don't necessarily understand how much things cost. You know, I, of course. I, I tell kids one of the big factors that um, shapes our world. So we talk about worldview in our class a lot, the first day or two. And it has to do with your foundational beliefs. And one of the factors that contributes to that is the, uh, your socioeconomic background. It's not the only factor by any means, but especially for kids in our very um, consumer-driven culture, one of the easy ways kids start to judge each other is based on their material stuff. What kind of phone do you have? Do you even have a phone? What kind of clothes do you wear? What kind of shoes do you wear? When you're old enough, what kind of car do you get? Do you get a car? Did you have to buy it? Did your parents buy it? And those are things that if we can teach kids when they're young not to judge people based on that, that's a, that's a good step in the right direction in terms of trying to create better people. Uh, my goal in the classroom is it's not just to teach kids how to be good writers or how to read better or how to understand the complexities of history. Um, my goal is to teach people to be better people. My goal is to teach students to become uh, respectful, productive members of society who pursue virtue and who pursue a lifelong education. If I can do that, I honestly do not care what your grade was in my class. I don't care if you got an A or a D. I, I just don't care what your number grade is. Did you become a better person during our semester together? If you didn't, then I failed you, regardless of what you did in my classroom. And we're on the same wavelength as a different type of teacher. I'm not in the uh, school classroom, but having been on the mats teaching for many years, I feel the same way because not all mm -hmm. body types are created equal. Yep. Not everyone is naturally athletic. So yep. some people, just like life, it's a comparison. You look around the room and you see people that are in better shape, that are younger, yep. that can kick higher, that are more athletically gifted, and you notice yeah. that you struggle. And the same would happen in the classroom. Yep. You, you study. I'm sure you have kids that study and put everything they have into it just, just to maybe get a C plus That's or, right. a, or a B and yep. another kid can kind of half ass it and end up with an A yes. and, and that can cause a lot of frustration, but that's just yeah. how we are. But same for what you just said. I just want to make sure people understand that we're all individuals and your only goal is to show up and just try your best. And one thing mm -hmm. I say a lot is, you know, maybe you're, we don't always feel a hundred percent every day of our life. Some days right. you feel 60%. So I'll tell yeah. my students, listen, if you're feeling 50 or 60% today, I expect when you get onto that mat that you're giving me 60% today. That's right. Give I, me a hundred percent of whatever you got. Exactly. Exactly. Yep. So, um, let me ask you a question, you know, rewinding a little bit when you were young, mm -hmm. did you see yourself growing up to be a teacher? Or, I mean, what was life like for you, uh, growing up in Alabama? Um, well, it's interesting. I didn't ever see myself becoming a teacher, but I knew that education was important. Um, so my mom is actually from this area, 
and she, as far as I know, uh, is her, her and her brother are, uh, and her sister were the first in their family to ever go to college. Uh, my mom has been a nurse for uh, a number of years. I don't want to say how many in case she listens to this. I don't want to get mad at me. Um, and my, uh, and so her dad actually dropped out of school, I think after eighth grade to go to work in a local cotton mill. Um, and then my father was actually uh, born in Illinois. His parents were sharecroppers. Uh, like you learn about in history class, like people that couldn't even own their own land, they were so poor. And uh, my dad was able to go to college and then uh, got drafted into Vietnam and got his master's thanks to the GI Bill. So both my parents made very clear to us that education matters. Um, not that you necessarily have to go to college, but if you have the ability to, why would you not? Um, and so uh, my older brother, my younger sister and I, we've all graduated from college and it was, they actually, and they, they literally put their money where their mouth is um, because they sent us to private schools our whole life. Now that's not saying it's necessarily better, but Alabama is not exactly known for having a great public school system. Um, and so my parents wanted us to get the best education we could. They sent us to private schools and uh, the idea there was to make sure that we were set up to be successful. And again, we didn't, we didn't have a ton of money. Dad was retired army and mom was a nurse. So we're not talking, you know, $20,000 a year like private boarding school. Um, but they did give us the best that they could. And they wanted to make sure that we understood they were doing it not for their benefit, but for ours. And uh, my goal was originally to become a lawyer. Uh, I love, I, I grew up reading John Grisham books. I think I read my first John Grisham novel when I was in fifth grade or something, and I just loved it. And then I got to college and about, I got I'm partway through my freshman year, I realized that being a lawyer probably isn't as much fun as it sounds like in the novels. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah. I also, um, a, a big life change that happened was I got married for the first time after my sophomore year of college. I was 19 years old, um, got married to a lady that I'd been dating for um, a couple years. And um, was really excited about starting what I considered the adult phase of my life. And so I had played college soccer my first two years, including my semester in England. But after I got married, I realized I need to go to work. If I'm, if I'm old enough to be married, I'm old enough to take care of my wife and not expect her to go to work so I can keep playing soccer. And um, so I, I quit playing soccer and, you know, got a job as a waiter and a bartender and that sort of thing. Um, and then after I graduated, um, I, uh, we actually found out beginning of my senior year, we were pregnant with our first kid. Wow. Uh, our first daughter. So yeah, so I graduated college in May of 2004. And in that one month of May, uh, graduated college, had a kid and moved 500 miles up to Fayetteville, North Carolina to start teaching and coaching high school history and soccer. And uh, it was it was sometime around when I got married that I realized what I really wanted to do was to work with high school kids or college kids. My original goal was to be a college professor. And the longer I've taught high school, the more I realized that's kind of where God wants me. That's, that's the age that he has me kind of geared toward is ninth through 12th graders. And, um, you know, I've been doing it now. This is my 13th year in the classroom. Um, and I feel very blessed to, uh, every day that I go to work, I get to do something that I love. Um, and that's not something that a lot of people have the, have the privilege to say. And so I'm really, really thankful for that in terms of getting to, um, you know, getting to work with kids, getting to teach them, getting to share the gospel with them in my classroom and getting to try to show them that life is not just about earning a big paycheck. Like, that's probably nice. And a lot of them come from families where they do. That's fine. There's, there's nothing wrong with earning a big paycheck. Um, but if that's the end goal for your education, you've missed the point. Yeah, well, of course. Because, I mean, it, again, the world makes you believe that materialism is, is everything. Right. Uh, but unfortunately, you can't take everything down six feet under, you know? I mean, right. you, you're left with your legacy and what people think about you and the life that you lived. And yeah. can you wake up every day and look yourself in the mirror and, 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 and be proud of the person that's looking back at you? Yeah. And a, a lot of people will look at the people that are rich and famous or well-established and have right. all the nice stuff. Right. Go off and as you go through life, find out these people are having the same struggles, the same trouble. I mean, we see it all the time, even with super famous, uh, beloved celebrities that are taking their own lives. Mm, yeah. Um, you know, whereas sometimes you meet the people that really don't have much. They have clothes, food, and shelter. Yep. They're the first ones out volunteering. They're the first ones out donating $25 to a charity. And mm -hmm. it's more about how you live your life, not what you uh, what you have to show for it in your bank account or in your driveway. So I, yep. I, couldn't, I couldn't agree more with what you said. But to just rewind a little bit on what you said there, you, sure. you got married at a young age. I, I happen yep. to meet my, my wife 
uh, she was 19, I was 21 mm -hmm. and got engaged a year later and, and so mm -hmm. on. But you said you got married at 19, dated for a few years earlier. So this is like a, like a high school sweetheart or. Well, um, I, I met her in high school. Uh, we started dating, um, sometime after I started college. Um, but we had, so we had known each other. We had become very good friends during high school and then started dating in college and, and got married after that. Um, and, uh, and yet, you know, that was something that, uh, that's one of the, the harder lessons that I've learned is that uh, sometimes fairy tales don't end the way that you want them to. Uh, so we were married for eight and a half years and in 2010, 2011, uh, we divorced. By that time we had two kids. Uh, both of them were still relatively young. I think the older one was, I guess, six, five or six at that point. Um, and, uh, you know, that was, that was about as low as life ever got for me because I went through divorce, changed jobs, uh, went through foreclosure on my house, went through bankruptcy, lost uh, custody of my kids for a while. Right. And, um, you know, just the, the hard, the hard stuff that happens. And one of the major lessons that I've learned is that even though I can't control all of my circumstances, I do have control over how I respond to them and being angry and bitter isn't going to, it's not going to help. And so, um, when I accepted that, that really helped me move forward. Um, I, uh, I had a lot of support from my church, had a lot of support from my friends, um, read a couple great books by C.S. Lewis that really helped me change my perspective on how to deal with pain that I was, uh, that I was feeling. And, um, you know, at this point, um, I'm remarried, been, been very happily remarried for almost four and a half years. My ex-wife is also remarried. She's been really happily married for about the same amount of time. And uh, we live a mile and a half apart. We get along really well. Um, my kids go back and forth each week. So the custody situation changed five or six years ago. And, uh, the, you know, the girls are, are doing well. Um, my wife and I are great. My ex-wife and her husband are great. And we're really thankful that, uh, we have a situation that enables us to get along well, even though there was a lot of pain and hurt on both sides in the past. Um, thankfully, uh, all four of us now have been able to come to a place where what we have in common is, we love our two girls and, and now the girls also have a little brother at their mom's house. And, um, you know, our job is to try to raise these kids well as a group. Um, and so we talk on the phone just about every day or we text each other to make sure that we're on the same page. If one of the kids doesn't feel well or there's a school function or, you know, yesterday was, but at the time of this recording, yesterday was my ex-wife's birthday. Well, the girls are with us this weekend, but it's her birthday. So please come grab the girls like you guys go. And so they went hiking and they had a big, you know, get together and like they had a great time. And we do those things because we want to teach our kids the important lesson that even if you don't see eye to eye on everything, that doesn't mean you can't be respectful. It doesn't mean you can't be kind. It doesn't mean you can't be loving. And uh, so I give a lot of credit to my wife, to my ex-wife and to her husband because I couldn't do this by myself. And, and none of the three of them could either. It takes all four of us working together to be in a situation where we can raise our kids together well, uh, even though it's hard. It's not, it's, not the, um, it's not the norm, but it is something that I think a lot more people could do if they were willing to put in the hard work to make it possible. Absolutely. Well, I mean, I, I want to come back to that because you, you said so many things that I want to readdress in a moment, sure. but if you could take me back just for a moment at the time that you guys are having your struggle is not getting into anything personal, but you uh, sure. you're a teacher at this point and you're yep. working every day. Yep. So the, the, the question that I have for you is that when you still have life, mm -hmm. when you still have work and you still have responsibilities and you have to be a mentor and a leader and focused and you have to have your game face on every day while for lack of a better metaphor, the world is falling down around you how yeah. do you get through that every day there's a lot of times where people have these moments these forks in the road in life mm -hmm. and they don't go the way that you went they go a different way they, right. they they enter that darkness that that everyone enters but then they can't get out of it yeah well, how were you able to still uh positively function each day while probably still having it in the back of your head day in and day out i would imagine yeah, no, it certainly was a struggle. And actually, um, right around the time of the separation and divorce, I actually got out of teaching for two years. Um, and so I worked a bunch of different jobs during that time. I was a, a bartender and a waiter and a firefighter and a construction worker and an insurance salesman and a financial planner. And all, you know, I, I did uh, cement pouring and, you know, whatever needed to get, like, I, I just needed to make enough money to pay child support mm. and pay my rent. And whatever I needed to do to make that happen, because what I didn't need to be doing at that time was trying to 
uh, was trying to teach kids in a classroom. I still coach soccer. I coach travel soccer club stuff, and that was a good outlet for me. Um, but honestly, for me, a lot of it went back to my faith. A lot of it went back to going to my mentors, uh, one of whom was my high school soccer coach. He's, um, he's a pastor now. At the time, he was my youth pastor and soccer coach. And um, he, after my own father, is probably the biggest male influence in my whole world. And, um, you know, throughout the entire process and the pain and the mistakes that I made, um, he, he stood alongside me and he encouraged me and he continued to remind me of the things that I know to be true. And he also, you know, he kept reminding me that um, life doesn't end that day. There's going to be a tomorrow and another day. And my job is every single day to be the best father I can be to my kids. And even after their mom and I divorced, my job is still to set a good example for how men should treat the, the, the women. And so that means even if we're divorced, I need to show my kids, this is how you need to be expect to be treated. This is how people should treat your mom. And if that's not happening, then we need to have a bigger discussion. There's a different, there's a different conversation we need to have. And so, uh, again, I'm, I'm really thankful for the people that were around me. I'm thankful for the, um, the uh, encouragement that I was given because it's not something I could have handled on my own. I mean, I, I, was, um, uh, I was definitely, uh, you know, depressed for a while. And I say depressed in the clinical sense. Like I uh, was on medication for a while, went and saw a counselor for a while. And, uh, and those things definitely helped as well. Um, I think that was for me, one of the hardest things was simply to admit that I could not do it on my own. Uh, one of the things you mentioned earlier was, you know, the difficulty of trying to be a, a parent while also working and doing these other jobs. And, uh, and for me, what I realized, one of the things that really led to problems in my first marriage is that I prioritized poorly. Uh, what I mean by that is I, I love my wife and my kids. I did. Um, but I didn't show them that with my actions because what I would do is I spent a lot of time at school and then I spent a lot of time coaching. And then when I came home, I immediately turned on the TV and spent a lot of time watching soccer and basketball and baseball because I love those sports. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, if I just get my kids to watch the game with me, well, that counts. And, and so what I was doing was I was prioritizing my desires and my job over my wife and my kids and learning those really harsh lessons. Those are some of the things that I put in the book that you mentioned at the beginning of this episode. Um, that's why the subtitle is lead others better by forgetting about yourself. Because if you can, you know, if you can take your desires and put them to the side and put the desires of the people around you first, one, it's going to result in better relationships and two better relationships is going to lead to better leadership because they're going to have more trust in me. They're going to have more faith in me that I will do what I say I'm going to do. And um, one of the real powerful things for me is in writing that book, it also revealed to me areas of my heart where I'm still putting my own needs first because it's one thing to write about putting other people first. It's another thing to actually do it every day. And, it, and so in the writing process, I was very convicted about ways that I was still, or at least maybe was falling back into in my new marriage, some of the old habits that I, that I brought from the old marriage. And that was a very, um, it was a very sobering moment. It happened over spring break this past school year. Uh, I told my wife, it was kind of like God sort of very lovingly popped me on the back of the head one day, the way that a, a father would do or an older brother and just kind of go, Hey, you know, wake up, buddy, you're writing this stuff and you are not doing it. And that's, that's not acceptable. And, um, and again, I, you know, it caused me to reevaluate what I was doing. It caused me to reevaluate my decisions and my priorities because I love the students that I teach and I love the students that I coach, but they're not my kids. I need to prioritize my own children first. And if I'm not doing that, then I'm doing a disservice to my own kids and I'm doing a disservice to my wife. And that's, that's not okay. I can still be a good teacher, but I need to put my kids first. And so I'm learning how to do that better this school year than I have in the past. And it's been a really interesting process of learning some of those things. Well, I think a few things that you brought up in describing that is that one challenge that we all have is putting our ego in check. Because <laughs> um, the ego could be there in one day to yep. fluff you up and tell you how amazing you are and how you're the absolute best at everything right. and you've done no wrong. And in the and within five minutes could also tear you down and make you feel yeah. like an absolute piece of garbage. Yep. So one, you it seems like you had to take a step back and separate you from your ego a little bit and observe, yeah. not just yep. the. I don't know if you're familiar with Eckhart Tolle at all and the Power of Now. Uh, 
uh, and, and a new earth. But one thing that he talks about a lot in ego is that we have to become separate from our thoughts. Often, mm. okay. uh, often the problem about a situation is not the situation that we're going through, but rather mm. our thoughts about the situation. Absolutely. Yeah. So I, I love that a lot that sometimes you have to separate, like, for example, if you're angry, uh, mm -hmm. One way of expressing that, uh, according to him, is just, you know, I'm angry and this is why and just jumping into it. Another way is taking a step back and going, I notice that there's some anger within me. Right. But the anger is not me. It's just something right. that I'm It's something I'm feeling, yeah. Exactly. So it seems like you had to take a moment and take a step back from your ego a little bit and, mm -hmm. and figure that out. And the other issue that I think that you brought up there that we all challenge ourselves with is balance. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, if you're career-oriented and, and, and an athlete and a coach and, and all that, that you want to be the best you can at it. So sometimes right. you have to be competitive and put all your eggs in one basket. But when you work in extremes, then something else suffers. And that's been a right. challenge that, that I've had as, as well, because if I put all my energy into the school, then my family is going to feel left out. Right. If I'm skipping events at the school and leaving early or coming late all the time because I'm with my family, my <laughs> right. students are going to feel disappointed. Yeah. And learning to balance the two out. And for me, especially as a business owner, to when I, I'm at the school, Mm -hmm. I get to be Master Alders. But when I come home, I get to be Eric, husband of my wife. I get to be right. daddy, father of my children, or I get to yep. be a brother, a son, and, and enjoy these other roles I play. But you have to be able to put some of these things on, on hold for a little while. Mm -hmm. And it seems like that you were having those struggles a little bit and trying to refine that that balance. And now going through the situation that you went through and learning from it. Mm -hmm. I have friends that have experienced it the way that you have and the exact opposite. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. sometimes when people are going through the struggle of divorce with children, especially, unfortunately, sometimes the children become pawns and a, yeah. tool, a tool that's used against one another. Yeah. Obviously those are the situations from the outside perspective I look at and it, it doesn't oh, work it just breaks well. your heart. It's yeah. horrible. And there's other friends that do what you do and they're very good at co-parenting and remove mm. their ego and go, we may not work well together as a couple, but right. we are, we, we've created these two life forms that right. we are ultimately responsible for. So yep. we need to put our issues aside Yep. And do we whatever we can to, to make these kids the best that they can be. Yeah, 100%. Um, I love what you said earlier, too. It reminded me of uh, another book that I'm reading now. It's called Search Inside Yourself um, by, I can't remember, I can't even pronounce the guy's name. It's the Google guy. Uh, it's a, anyway, it's a book that I got this summer. I was at Duke this summer helping teach a um, uh, summer studies leadership class to high school kids. And that was one of our textbooks. And it reminded me of what you said about how when you're, when you're feeling angry, you don't have to be defined by that anger. You can, you can acknowledge that the anger itself, it's an emotion and there's something that's caused it, but you don't have to let that dictate your attitude after it. And you don't have to let it dictate your actions in this particular moment. Um, another thing you mentioned that I really appreciate, it was funny, you mentioned earlier that we're, you know, we're not all created with the same body type. Or we're not all created with the same athletic gifts. And uh, it's funny, I know we're, we're doing this interview, we got the video going, whatever, but you can't tell because I'm seated. I'm, I'm only about five foot three. And, uh, and so that's in any world, that's a, that's a small male human being. And um, yeah, for to have been able to play college sports, even at my size, I'm very thankful for that. But I think one of the reasons I was able to is because I, uh, and this is not a, uh, a brag, it's actually a confession. Um, I think I really embraced in a negative way, the Napoleon complex. And what I mean by that is whether it was playing sports or even now as a teacher and a coach, um, very much feeling the need to prove myself adequate in every classroom, mm. in every team situation. Because if I walk in and I look mostly like a middle schooler, well, that, I, that does not command immediate respect the way that it would if I were even five foot 10 or six feet tall, or you know what I mean? And, uh, and so part of the job for me as an adult has been, how do I act responsibly without immediately feeling like I have to prove myself? How do I, how do I act confidently without coming across as arrogant and also without coming across as if I'm trying too hard to, mm -hmm. you know, make up for the fact that I'm, that I'm five foot three. And it's, you know, it's been really interesting to, um, to be, uh, to be very aware of that. It's been very humbling to cause me to say, you know what, maybe the best option is just don't even worry about it. Don't think about it because I'm not responsible for how people think about me. Mm -hmm. I can't, my goal is not to change their opinion of me. My goal is to do the right thing in every situation. 
and then leave the rest up to God. It's not up to me to make right. them, you know, it's not, it's not my job to have a good reputation. My job is to do the right thing and let everything else sort itself out. And, you know, that, that takes me back to what we were discussing in terms of parenting. Um, like you mentioned, sometimes parents don't make the best decisions in terms of kids, especially if, if they're parents who are divorced and maybe they've hurt each other. And uh, again, so part of my, part of my encouragement would be, uh, to ask yourself, you know, what, what do you need to let go of in order to parent your kid in the way that they need to be parented? That is what kind of pain do you need to let go of? What kind of hurt, what kind of ego issues, whatever it may be. Um, but do whatever it takes to take yourself out of the equation from an ego perspective so that you can take care of your kids. Uh, one of the, one of the discussions my wife and I had recently is how um, a lot of parents seem like they have forsaken parenting. That is, they've given it up in, in favor of sort of being a customer service representative to their kid. You know, making sure that, well, I got to make sure they have this and I got to make sure they have this and I got to make sure they have this. And it's like, yeah, but when you do that, are you making sure they're learning how to do that for themselves or are you just taking care of it? Because again, I, I teach high school kids. The ones that I teach either have their driver's permit or they're about to get it or they have a driver's license. And some of them don't even know how to run a dishwasher. Mm -hmm. well, if, look, if you don't know how to run a dishwasher, I'm not giving you keys to a $60,000 SUV. You've lost your mind. And so, uh, again, one of the encouragements I would say is make sure that when you're parenting, you're also parenting. And that's hard because I, I want my kids to like me. I do. But I've got a teenage daughter. And if she's never mad at me for anything, yeah. I, wasn't, I wasn't tough enough on her. Absolutely. That, you know, and that's just, that's got to be okay. As parents, we have to accept that. Well, I think, and uh, we, we, we think along the exact same <laughs> lines, honestly. And you, you said you have two daughters? I do, 14 and 11. And thank God, okay. they're, they're a lot better kids than I deserve. <laughs> Fabulous. So. And I have 12-year-old I have twin girls. So we could relate. Oh, wow. On, okay. Yep. We could relate on being outnumbered in our household by females. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yep. But I, the point that you bring up, though, that I also address a lot, especially also as a martial arts instructor, and you see this with all, as you do, you see so many different types of parents and so many different types of approaches that they take mm -hmm. with their kids. And the thing that I try to relate to them, or just when speaking to friends about parenting, is that you can't just cover the kid's eyes and cover the kid's ears yeah. and do everything for them. Right. Make every decision for them. Ultimately, as a parent, it is our mission and our goal to teach them how to enter life and mm -hmm. to travel through life and become the best person version of themselves they could be to be respectful yep. of others to be independent yep. to be hardworking, to have good ethics yep. to be a contributor of society and it's ultimately our choice to try to do that when we're right. not around it's right. amazing if they could be the best kids in the world while we're there over their shoulder coaching them yeah but i find it um most impressive when my kids are at someone else's house or another yeah. event and the parents or the people there tell me how well behaved my girls are, right. or how well off they are. That's the ultimate test because we're not here right. forever. It is Correct. our job to, to teach and grow functional human beings that will be That's a better right. version of ourselves when we are not around. And unfortunately, yeah. I'm sure you've seen it too with, with uh, what is the term, helicopter parents and things yes. like that. I've had some parents that literally um, – will 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 speak for their children i even take a step past that how about staff members that i've had mm. that the parent would come in and quit for them wow like, yeah stand there with their teen that's you know maybe an assistant instructor and go well uh, my son or daughter, uh, it's not working out for them and they want to do this, this and that. So it's just not working out. And I'm like, why aren't they speaking to me right now? And I'll right. say like, listen, you can do what you want, but here's a little life lesson on like how you should approach life. Like, and my wife works at Starbucks and she has kids that, that quit via text messages and, and then yeah. their mom shows up the next day to, to drop off the keys. It's like, this is the opposite guys of what we should right. be doing. Yeah. as parents and what you said yep. is is right along with that that same philosophy and do you encounter that as well with certain types of parents that are just like here let me just let me just take that uh, homework that mr hallbaker <laughs> gave you and I'll, I'll i'll do it for you and, yeah and go on. yeah and and again i i don't want to be disrespectful to them because the thing is they're they're well intended that's the issue is the parents mean well they're trying to protect their kid they're trying to help their kid and those are laudable goals but I would argue, just like you mentioned, perhaps the issue is that they, 
haven't thought about it from a long-term perspective um, because the question is if if your kid is in high school and you are still handling all of their issues such as quitting a job or um, you know deciding not to take part in martial arts lessons anymore whatever it may be um, at what point do you stop like are you gonna travel with them to college and you're gonna argue with their professor when they get a grade they don't like are, are you gonna go with them on their job interview after college like where does it end and, um, and that's something that, again, I haven't done it perfectly. There, I'm sure there have been times when I've uh, looked like a helicopter parent. Um, and, uh, and, and those are moments when I have to then step back and say, no, wait a minute. If, what I, if some parent had just addressed me the way that I just addressed my daughter's teacher, how would I feel about that from the teacher side? And then I've got to go back and show, okay, you know what? You need to go take care of this, sweetheart. This is, this is your issue. You need to go have this conversation with your teacher. I, that's not my place to do that. And if that doesn't work, well, sure, I'll come and support you afterward. But you need to address this yourself. You're again, you're 14 years old. You're going to start driving at the end of this school year. God help us all. And um, you know, if that's the case, then you need to you need to be working on responsibility for you. And again, it's amazing how well when you really reinforce that consistently, how well not just kids but people in general will step up and do that. A lot of times we think kids are irresponsible and it's simply because they've never had to be responsible. And so in the rare occasion when they have the opportunity, they don't do it. But if we give them multiple opportunities in a short space of time, a lot of times kids will, kids will pick it up. You know, one of the big things I tell kids in my classroom is when you're absent, it's your job to come to me before class or after class, find out what work you missed, get it made up, get it turned in. I am not going to chase you down. I teach 70 to 80 kids a day. My job is not to come behind you and be your mommy and make sure that you get everything done. No. If you come and find me, I'll gladly give you your work. If you don't, I'm just going to put a zero in the grade book and move on. That's it's up again, to you. It's again teaching people how to become responsible for themselves. Yep. And, and there have to be consequences. Yeah. yeah. People don't want to be responsible for themselves. And it's right. what, usually it's uncomfortable. Well, I don't want to talk to Mr. Mm-hmm. Hawbaker because I'm nervous. I'm, That's right. He's going to be mad at me. Right. And, which and is they, a very common thing, actually. Uh, it's uncomfortable. Yeah, guess what? Yeah. Life's uncomfortable. That's working, right. Working with certain people is uncomfortable, you know, interviewing for yeah. a job. But you've got to learn to, to still yeah. manage and get through it. And if you just go, well, I don't want a mom and I don't want a dad. Okay, sweetheart, I'll do it for you. That's not right. always – not that you have to send them out into the world with no right. assistance. But, right. again, it comes back to a balance. I do agree with it you. Does. It comes from a point of, of good intention. Yeah, they mean well. Carried away. They do. Yeah. But it, like, yeah, it's exactly it. It just, it goes a little too far. And, and I think that's the difficulty is that people don't realize. And again, I've been guilty of it. We may not realize when we're actually doing our kids a disservice by not letting them do things themselves. My wife and I were talking yesterday. We were, um, uh, my, so we've got the two dogs we were discussing before the thing came on and, uh, they're, they're giant 50, 60 pound, um, uh, shelter dogs. So one is a pit bull mix and one's like a bulldog boxer mix or something. One of them loves to go under my older daughter's bed and chew on the cloth that covers the box springs. That drives me crazy because then it hangs down and it looks all raggedy. So anyway, yesterday we're cleaning up in, in my daughter's room, cleaning up that box spring part. So I'm stapling it back to the bottom of the bed and I turn and I look and I see her trash can is overflowing and I almost reached out and grabbed it and just took it out. And then I looked at my wife and I said, yeah, I'm just going to let her do that when she gets home instead of doing it for her. Because in the past, sometimes I've just done that. You know, I'm just, I'm dad. And especially if it's a week when they're not here, I'll just grab their trash and I'll take it out without thinking about it. Well, the problem is I am robbing her of an opportunity to exercise a little bit of responsibility and self-management. When your trash can is overflowing, baby, just take it out and put a new trash bag. That's not even hard to do, but I need you to start doing that. I need you to be proactive. One, I need you to notice Two, I need you to handle the situation. And if you can't handle it, well, by all means, then come and get me. And um, it's funny, one of, the, one of the examples I tell people, uh, so again, I'm, I'm five foot three and I'm the tall parent for my kids, if that gives you an idea about how small they are. So my freshman daughter is, she is barely, barely over five feet tall. But when she turned 13, part of her, I, I jokingly say this kind of tongue in cheek, part of her uh, birthday gift that year, was I taught her how to cut the grass using a push mower. And it's, you know, it's one of those things where um, it's not actually difficult. I mean, it's kind of physically difficult. We have almost a half acre of land. Well, that's fine. Um, But the reason I taught her that is because, baby, this is just a life skill you need to have. If you're ever going to live on your own, you may need to know how to work a lawnmower and cut the grass. 
great, well, let's learn right now. And so as she gets closer to driving, we're going to teach her how to change the oil and check her oil and change a flat tire because I would love to be able to come and help you at every moment of every day. I can't guarantee that your cell phone's going to have service wherever you may break down. I'll gladly come to you if I can, but you need to know how to change a tire because if you're stuck on your own, you need to be able to handle it. And that's, you know, it's, it's a little thing, but it's something that um, I think, again, especially in our society, we don't really do rites of passage into adulthood the way that traditional historical societies have done. Um, you know, getting your driver's license is kind of a rite of passage. Graduating high school is kind of a rite of passage. But those are, those are stagnant moments. It's like you get your driver's license and, and now what? Now you can drive? Okay, great. And, you know, you haven't, you haven't proven a whole lot. It's not like the driver's test is hard to pass. Look at some of the drivers that are on the road, especially if you come down here to Alabama. Um, you know, and same thing with like you graduated high school. That's awesome. And now you're moving on. But are you actually ready to enter the real world? Because mm -hmm. you haven't, you know, you've proven something by graduating high school. But you haven't proven that much to me yet. Right. Well, it goes back uh, to teaching them to be independent and functioning yeah. in this world without us. But yep. I'm curious as a teacher, because I love having sure. conversations with my, with my teacher friends about mm -hmm. this. And it was my own observation going through school that I feel like there's certain people that are absolutely made for school and made, yes. for, made for testing. Oh, yeah. And on paper, they're smart and they're valedictorians and they go to college. And some of these people, like you had mentioned, don't know how to change a tire, don't know how to cook yep. a meal, don't know how to interview right. for a job, don't know the... Right credit, you know, valueness, how to shop for a home, you, you name it. Yeah. I've always felt in my opinion, not that I'm changing the world that, you know, <laughs> elementary school, high school is an, an amazing place to establish the foundation of education with right. writing, literacy, etc. Right. But if you're going to go for further education, like college and stuff, it's in my opinion that I would love to have seen a, a way that you could just give people life skills so that anyone yeah. that goes to school, uh, and after education, after high school, that you do learn about balancing a checkbook and credit. I think you should have courses on understanding the opposite sex, how to communicate properly with each, each other, psychology. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's so many categories that I feel like could give you essential life skills. Right. Then you could learn a trade. You could apprentice with someone. You could learn right. in the field. But often you get to that point where people graduate and they, and I see it with my, my wife as well at Starbucks, it's that people are smart uh, on books, but they don't right. have, they don't have common sense. They don't have work Correct. ethic. They don't understand about showing up early or, or yeah, you're, mm. you're, 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 you're supposed to punch out at this time, but your job's not done. So spend five more right. minutes and do it the right way. Yep. I feel that there's a, a lacking in our education system with giving people the essential life skills that would make productive human beings overall. Mm -hmm. and, and then you take on whatever trade that you, you have. Right. How do you feel about that specifically with your experience as an educator? Yeah, no, I think so. I think there's two different parts of what you mentioned that I would, that I'd love to kind of address. And the first one, I think you're right about education is that a lot of times um, there are kids who coast through their formal education and don't actually learn very much. And I was honestly, I was one of those kids. I graduated high school with a great GPA, didn't really have to study. You know, I, I took some notes um, and then I went to college and when I got to college, I realized how little I actually knew outside of the classroom and outside of now my, my parents had taught me at home. I knew how to change oil and change a tire and wash dishes and wash clothes. And like, you know, my parents divorced when I was in middle school and my brother moved out at the same time. And so when I was 13, I went from being the youngest guy in the house to the only guy in the house. So the, the amount of responsibility falling on Joel drastically increased. So I learned a lot of those things, but I learned them at home. And so I think part of the problem is that uh, our education is supposed to teach certain life skills in a supplementary way. That is, things should have been learned at home, and the education is there to enhance those. And if those things aren't being learned at home, there's only so much I can do in the classroom. Now, that doesn't absolve me of total responsibility. Part of my job that I tell my history kids, my Bible kids, and my soccer players, my job is to teach you life lessons. It's not If all I teach you is how to write a good essay or evaluate both sides of an argument or kick a soccer ball, well, I haven't actually done my job as well as I should have. I need to teach you those things, but I need to teach you more than that. I need to teach you why running all the way to a line on every sprint matters. It's like you mentioned. If you're not done with your job, you don't punch out yet. If, if, you run, if, you're, if I tell you to run to midfield and back and you cut it one step short, you have failed. I don't care if you actually won 
that particular race. You failed because you, you cut a corner, and that may not matter to you now, but it will matter in the future. If you're a corner cutter, it will come back to bite you. Right. Um, you know, that and philosophy, it's philosophy, I think, will stick with you. Yeah, and it is. It's a quit early. The next yep. time you have a chance to quit early, that feeling will be very common, and you'll yep. go to it quicker, and it becomes yeah. a pattern yep. throughout life. Absolutely. It's a, you know, and it's a biblical principle that we teach. You know, if you're faithful in the little things, you're faithful in the big things. So you, the little moments are the training for the big moments. The big moments are what we think of as defining our lives, but really our lives are made up of millions of tiny moments. And the question is, what did you do in those? Because those determine what you did in the big one. So if you've trained, just like I'm sure you guys do with martial arts, like there's a proper technique. And if you're trying to shortcut it, even if you win, you didn't do it right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, um, and, you know, and so that's the first part of the question is I think that um, we need to do a better job, whether it's as parents or teachers or both, of doing exactly what you described, which is incorporating the life lessons into whatever the actual curriculum is. So my job is to teach kids how to become better people and history or Bible class or soccer. Those are just the vehicle. Uh, I've got a buddy from college, a soccer teammate who is a brilliant soccer coach. And that's exactly what he said. He was actually quoted in a coaching book that I read a couple years ago. Uh, the guy's name is Chris Cushenberry. And he said, you know, my job is to help these young men become better young men. Soccer is just the vehicle for how we do that. Absolutely. And I love that mentality. Um, so the, and the, the second part I would mention is that part of the problem with the education system is that it has become so geared toward passing standardized tests that it doesn't leave as much room for teachers to do the life lesson teaching. Because if your whole job is based on making sure your kids get good test scores, guess what your priority is going to be? Making sure they get good test scores. And Absolutely. so I think, I think part of the problem is that we have a, as a society have – I just read an article about this yesterday. Uh, it, was for, uh, it started with a letter from a parent who said, well, if the kids aren't doing well in the teacher's class, we should replace the teacher. It's like, no, 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 you're missing the whole point because no matter how great a teacher is, if the kids aren't interested in learning, there's only so much we can do. Now, there, there's a small select number of teachers who can simply get every kid in the classroom interested. The majority of teachers aren't that way, mm -hmm. and, it's, and it's because if you have a kid who hasn't been taught, education is important. If you have a kid that hasn't been taught, you need to respect the teacher as your authority and, and listen to what they're trying to tell you. If you have a kid that hasn't been taught, the value of what you're learning in the classroom will go beyond the classroom. There's only so much I can do. Um, you know, the, the old, the old uh, adage, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him think or can't make him drink is very true. Uh, you, you can lead a kid to the classroom. You can't make him think. It's the same kind of thing. Um, and so, again, I would say that it comes back to us as parents, and also it, in, it raises the level of challenge that you and I have as teachers because if parents haven't done their job, that doesn't absolve me of responsibility. It just means my job is going to be harder. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I accept that. But it also means that I need to be willing to engage the parents and ask for their help to partner with me to help make their kids better. Um, again, the, I love what you've said about trying to become the best versions of ourselves. That's actually how – that's part of how I define leadership. My definition of leadership is um, it's the art of positively influencing the people around you to help them become better versions of themselves. Mm, and like so that. With, with that kind of definition, that means every person is a leader whether it's at home, in your business, in a classroom, in a sporting, uh, on a sports team, every person has the ability to be a positive influence. And every role you have, that is a leadership role. Or it's training you for a future leadership role. Everything you do. So whether it's, um, you know, working your first job as a, uh, a bag boy at a local grocery store, which is what I did when I was 15, um, or whether it's being a soccer coach running a varsity program, some of the lessons I learned as a bag boy, those are things I still do as a, a coach with 35 kids in my program. Um, because one of the things I learned is do your job, do it well, even when you don't like it. Okay, great. Well, that's, you know, uh, I tell a story about my, my older daughter. She's 14 now, right? So back when she was in preschool, she um, was, it was preschool graduation, which is an entirely different conversation. I, I don't know why you should graduate from like, you took good naps and you didn't eat too much paste, but whatever. Um, it's, it's a good, I guess it's a good chance for grandparents to celebrate their kids, your grandkids getting older. But so what was happening was I loved her preschool teacher and what the preschool Miss Susie would do. The preschool teacher would say, um, you know, here's little Johnny. And he was really great because he made sure the kids put their toys away every day. 
And here is little Alice, and she was wonderful because she helped remind me when it was time for snacks. And so she said something sweet about each kid. Well, when it was my daughter's turn, she said, this is, this is Carly, and she was my little teacher helper. Because when students didn't want to do their work, she would look at them and say, sometimes you have to do things you don't want to do, because that's life. And as, as Miss Susie was saying that, Carly at four years old was just nodding her head. That's and I, st I just, I cracked up because I thought, well, I know where she's heard that. She's heard it at home every day of her life. Carly, put your toys away. Dad, I don't want to. Baby, I love you. I didn't ask if you wanted to. Right. Put your toys away. Sometimes you have to do stuff you don't want to do because that's life. And you know, as an adult, it only gets harder as you get older. Kids in high school think, well, when I graduate, I'm going to do whatever I want. Well, no, you're not. You're only going to do whatever you want if your mom lets you keep getting away with it. Because when you graduate, you have more responsibility, mm -hmm. less freedom. That's what happens. Because when you get married and you have kids and you have a job and you have a boss, guess what? All of those people are going to have claims on your time. And even if you don't get married or have kids, you're going to have a boss or you're going to have shareholders in your company that you started or you're going to have customers. Bottom line, you have someone else that you are responsible to. It's, and that never goes away. And so you just need to accept that. And, and the, the quicker you accept it, the easier life gets. Well said. Well, I think your, your conversation that you just had and your definition of leadership is a perfect transition to talk about your, your book a little bit. Sure. So my curiosity, there's thousands of teachers that are out there and there's thousands of people that have had divorced homes or might have grown up feeling like a small guy and having to, <laughs> you know, to prove themselves as you highlighted. Uh, but not everyone becomes a, an author or a public speaker. So where does your motivation for writing your book come from? That's a great question. Honestly, it came a lot from a conversation or two that I had with my wife. I love teaching and coaching, and I have for years. And uh, becoming a speaker and an author are simply extensions of the classroom to me. They are ways to try to have a positive influence on an even bigger audience because um, I love the kids that I teach. Um, but I would love to also be able to pass on some of the lessons I've learned to people not just in high school, not just in my classroom. And um, it's not because I necessarily think that I have all the world's wisdom, but I do know that I've made a lot of mistakes. And if I can help other people avoid those mistakes by sharing the lessons I've learned, then it's worth it. Um, and so I, I, even, uh, I even mentioned in the book that you mentioned at the beginning, the, the real life leading, that's the, the name of my website, just reallifeleading.com. And the reason for that is because I'm probably never going to be a corporate CEO. I'm never going to be a military commander. I'm never going to be the uh, head coach of a professional sports group, probably never going to be in anybody's hall of fame. That's okay. Most of us aren't going to be that. So sometimes when we read books by those people, they're hard to identify with. I have, I have, you can see behind me, I have bookshelves full of those books. Um, I love Coach K from Duke Basketball. He's one of my, my mentors from afar because I've got multiple books that he's written on leadership. Um, there's a guy named Michael Zigarelli whose book, uh, The Messiah Method, I am reading now for the third or fourth time in the past three or four years. Um, and it's all about leadership within the context of soccer. But the, the truth is most of us aren't going to be those things, but we're all going to be parents or volunteers in our communities or Sunday school teachers or uh, we're going to have some some group of people that we are in charge of. Well, that doesn't mean your leadership is any less important because your audience is smaller. It just means your audience is smaller and it, it really may mean you have a bigger impact because if I have 35 kids in my soccer program, but I have two kids in my home, which kids do I have more time with? Mm -hmm. Well, my, my two kids in my home, that means I have a bigger chance to impact them. And so the smaller your audience, the bigger your impact can be. Uh, so the idea there is um, uh, I was talking with my wife about doing my public speaking and, and presenting at different, you know, high schools and colleges and businesses and things like that. And the question became, what else can I do to try to get word out? And the answer was write a book. And so then the next challenge was when, because again, wife, two kids, high school teacher, soccer coach. And it's funny, the answer became in my car. Um, and so I actually did a lot of my writing, quote unquote, um, while I was driving. I had a, um, my, uh, my father was very old school. And so he had a mini cassette recorder that when he passed away a decade ago, I kept. So like when you, when you watch movies from the nineties and you see newspaper reporters talking into their little, you know, with a tiny miniature, like you had in the uh, answering machines. Exactly. 
I had one of those. So what I would do is I'd write out the outline to a chapter on a three by five card and kind of tape it to my steering wheel. And I drive down the road. And as I'm driving, I'm speaking the chapter into this mini cassette recorder and I'd come home and my wife would type it up for me. And that became the rough draft of the book. That's and a great then, story. Um, I love that. Well, I, I wish I'd come up with that on my own. I learned it from a guy named Chandler Bolt, who is, uh, he wrote a book called published. It's all about self publishing. And, uh, and that was where I caught, I got that idea. It was like, Oh, that's brilliant because that's, that's an hour and a half a day that I right. cannot get rid of. I have 45 minute each direction commute. So let's, let's make use of that 45 minutes, not just to entertain myself and not just to learn via podcasts or books, but to actually create something. And so that's what I did. It took me about three or four months to get the rough draft done. Um, that was fall of last year. And then over Christmas break and spring break, that's when I did all my editing because down here in Alabama, spring is high school soccer season. So from January through May, I'm busy every day, during the day, after school, soccer games, soccer practice, tournaments, whatever. And, um, and so I was able to get the work done in the car or over my school breaks. And then the book was published this past summer. And uh, very thankful to have that done. I just mentioned yesterday on the way to church to my wife, I said, um, so I'm thinking about trying to get another book done by this coming spring. <laughs> and she said, well, okay. <laughs> because it was just... You know, it, like we talked about earlier, prioritizing. If I'm going to do all the things I already have, with that is a wife and kids and dogs and soccer and, and school, if I'm also going to write another book, something has to go. And so what will go is a lot of my free time that I'm at home. So I'm going to watch less soccer games in the next six months if I write another book. I'm going to watch less basketball games. I'm going to spend less time puttering on social media because mm -hmm. I'm going to put those things aside for something that has more lasting value. And again, that's one of the lessons that we need to be teaching kids. You know, I get a lot of kids that gripe about homework. Well, I didn't have time. That's bull crap. How much time did you spend staring at your phone yesterday? Mm -hmm. Do not lie to me and say you didn't have to. You didn't take time because it's not important to you. Well, I think the point you bring up also there is that people are full of excuses of why, yeah. they, why they either don't start something. Yeah do good at it or finish it or complete it, whatever it may be is excuses. And for yeah. you, it would have been very easy to say, I can't write a book because right. of X, Y, and Z. Yeah. And well, then, I've been doing that for 10 years. Actually. I, I started to write a book on my dad before he died. And I just finished the ebook about him last year. And it, I mean, it was really, cause I was just like you said, excuses literally for a decade. Well, I can't finish cause I'm busy with these other things. And no, my, my wife has been a huge encouragement. She's the reason why I finished the ebook about my dad and the full length book about leadership, because she just said, if it's really something that's important to you, you'll find a way to get it done. Absolutely. Well, I tell my students as well is that you could have results or yeah. you could have excuses, but you cannot have both. It's one. Yeah, of the, that's great. You know? um, so w while we're on the topic of, of your book, mm -hmm. Uh, one question I had for you before we get into the content of it is sure. why, why inverted leadership? What does that mean to you? And why did you choose that as a title? Yeah, great. Um, I love that question. It's fun to explain um, because so many people think leadership is about how do I do things to get certain results. And really for me, leadership is about serving other people. And so it's about forgetting about yourself. That's again, that's the subtitle. So what you're doing is, um, or what the book does is it takes traditional ideas about leadership. I have to do this so that this X, Y, Z result happens. And it turns it upside down. And it says, no, no, what I need to do is I need to serve the people that are on my team. I need to serve the people that I'm in charge of. I need to ask questions of the people that I have authority over to learn how to better get to the, the goal that we are all striving toward. It's not about me implanting my vision and making them hop on board. It's about me positively influencing them. Well, the only way I can positively influence somebody in a small group setting is by knowing them first. So I've got to ask questions instead of issuing orders. There, there will come a time when I issue orders. Don't get me wrong. Like I, I, I don't only ask questions of my soccer players. But if all I do is issue orders, I'm not leading as well as I could. So the, uh, one of the original titles I thought of for the book was just paradox, because again, it's this idea of the way that you actually lead people better is by forgetting about your ego and forgetting about your desires. What you want to do is get them on board. And that means you've got to get to know them first. So mm -hmm. we focus a lot in that book on creating better relationships. Um, I tell people all the time, if you focus on creating good relationships, the results will take care of themselves. 
Um, so like our high school soccer program has been really good the past few years. Um, in the last four years, we've been to the state quarterfinals twice and the state championship game twice. And we lost both those state title games. But five years ago, we had never won a playoff game. And now we've been at least in the top eight, if not the top two, for four straight years. Well, that's pretty cool. Well, that didn't come because we were making winning soccer games our main focus. Our main focus was on getting better and treating each other better. Because in a, in a team sport where 11 people are on each team and there's no timeouts, I as a coach have limited influence about what happens once, once the game starts. What that means is the girls on the field, because I coach high school girls, they have to know that their teammates are going to pick them up when they stumble. They have to know that their teammates are going to take care of their jobs. And when everybody's on, on board with that, well, now we can get some great results. So if you take care of relationships, the results will take care of themselves. And the same thing is, uh, you know, same thing's true in the family. Um, if I want to help my kids become great people, I first need to know who they are. And then we have to have an idea of who they want to become so that I can help them get there. And I can't do that if all I'm ever doing is issuing orders without listening to where their hearts are coming from. And I'm sure, you know, as a dad with daughters, sometimes it's hard for me to understand what's going on in the little girl's heart and mind. I've never been a little girl, so I don't have any firsthand experience with that. Right. And so that makes my job even harder. But, but that's great because that means I have to be more intentional about listening to them and where they're coming from. Um, I know at 36 years old that what happened to my 11 year old in her soccer game on Saturday, it is not that big a deal, but she doesn't know that she's 11. What she knows is she got scored on and it was embarrassing to her and it was really hard. Well, okay. Well that means I need to make sure that I listen to where she's coming from and don't minimize that. So just those kind of things. Becoming more of a, of a guide as well is being a mm -hmm. good leader. Again, leaders, not like you said, always given directions or directions needed to go to point A to point B. Like uh, when right. I'm, when I'm teaching my instructors uh, to teach, so it's like, I have a role obviously as the teacher, but I also have to be the teacher of the teachers. Right. And I said, there's a really big difference between being a teacher and being an instruction giver. Mm, yeah, Any, that's good. Anyone can stand in front of this class and go, do this, do this, do this, do this. Right. But to be able to observe mm -hmm. and see all these different body types and personalities and restrictions and, 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 and positive attributes and be able to figure out how to communicate to everyone. You mm -hmm. have to, I'm sure you found this as a teacher, it's not just one way of saying things. I have to learn right. how to use a hundred different metaphors. Yes. I, I was just teaching a class or a private lesson last week and I, mm -hmm. I was teaching something without getting into it that I've taught a thousand times right. and they were not getting it. And uh. on the spot, I thought of a different way to approach it mm -hmm. and I had to stop and out loud, I was like, why did it take me 25 years <laughs> to figure yeah. out how to word it that way? That makes yeah. so much more sense. So right. the process of me trying to help others understand also allows me to become a better teacher myself. When you mm -hmm. truly are trying, when my intention is trying to help this person get what I'm trying to teach, when I truly care about their development and their growth and not just getting out what I have to say and moving on to the next thing, Right. That's when you actually, you have a, a shared experience with one another. And I feel like Absolutely. that's, that's kind of what you're bringing up. Yeah, no, I love that because you're exactly right. The same thing happens in my history classroom. Sometimes I'm trying to get a point across. I've taught the same exact class now. This is my sixth year at this high school. I've taught the same class for 12 semesters, you know, or 11 semesters now. And some kids just aren't getting it. And so I have to come up with a new way to help explain this concept or to give an example or an illustration that undergirds this concept. And, uh, you know, and I have the same kind of moment where it's like, why did it take me 11 semesters of teaching this to think of this one illustrate? I have no idea, but you're exactly right when you, uh, and that's, that's one of the hallmarks of being an experienced teacher is being able to think on your feet and realize one, okay, the way that I'm explaining it isn't getting it across the way it needs to. So two, I need to come up very quickly with a way to explain this that gets the point across. Right, and um, it forces you to, to reach inside and always mm -hmm. evolve and ne never yeah. settle, never think, well, I'm the teacher, so I know That's it right. all. I've went to school. No, you have to be the constant student. Yeah. You, you yep. could learn from your, your students and your girls on the field and your kids mm -hmm. as much as you can from adults, as long as you remain an open book. And again, for me too, as, as, the, as the black belt, air quotes, as the, as the, <laughs> as the mentor, mm -hmm. I... I call a four-year-old sir the same way I call a 40-year-old sir. If, right. if, 
if you ask a question or bring something up, it, it, I have to be open to learning and evolving and changing yep. and growing and not just accepting that I, I know it all. Because I feel like right. once you settle and think you know it all, that's the day you die. You yeah. Know? You yep. have to keep growing. Um, I wanted to ask you a question when you're, when you're talking to people about your book, or maybe rephrase this, if, if you haven't brought it up in your conversation so far and you mm-hmm. wanted to bring out some, some tips or a highlight or one solid thing from your book that, that people are listening to this on, whether it has to do with parenting or maybe mm-hmm. they're out there like you and whatever the career they're in, they, they feel like they have a message they want to get out and write a book. What, what, what comes out of your book that if you could say, here's a sample of what you're going to get by going on Amazon and, and, and reading my book or listening sure. to it, what, what would you like to, to, to provide without giving the whole thing away? Well, I would, I would uh, mention two things very briefly. One is that the whole philosophy of the book is called uh, confident humility. And the idea there is that you take what you know you're good at, that's the confident part, and you use it to serve other people. That's the humility part. Humility simply means thinking of ourselves less often. That's how C.S. Lewis defined it. So the whole idea of leadership to me is take what you're good at, serve other people, right? And one of the ways that we do that, one of the things in the book um, that I, I so there's three main points to it. I just want to mention one of them, um, and that is be the first. And what that phrase means is be the first to give and to take. Be the first to give credit where it's due and be the first to take responsibility. It also means be the first to reach out to others. So if there's a situation that needs addressing, be willing to step up and address that situation. If there's a person who is hurting and you need to reach out and reconcile with them, don't wait on someone else to make the situation better. You go do that. The the quote that ends that chapter is a very famous quote from uh, uh, Mohandas Gandhi where he said, be the change that you want to see in the world. Well, that's one of the essential parts of leadership is Uh, If you want something to be different, you have to be willing to step out of your comfort zone and pursue making that happen. Even if you fail trying, at least you didn't just sit back and watch. You gave it a shot. So one of the key things I would say is if you if you read the book, um, you know, it will it will hopefully encourage and inspire you to be willing to be the first. Whether that means, again, sharing credit with your team. Um, I, I, t- I actually did another view uh, last week where I mentioned this. Uh, have you ever heard the illustration about of a, uh, a turtle on a fence post? No. Uh, it's probably a very Alabama thing. Um, if you ever drive down the road and you see a turtle sitting on the fence post, you can be rest assured of one very true thing every time. And that is that the turtle did not get there by itself. Well, that's true of all of us leaders. No matter where you are, you had some help. It could have been a spouse, could have been a business partner, could have been a a friend, a mentor, a pastor, a coach in your past, whatever it is, somebody helped you. Great. Well, give them credit because when you do that, everybody around you knows you're not just in it for you because you're sharing the credit. Well, that makes them want to work for you more because they know that if they do well, their efforts will get recognized too. And um, and I think that's an important aspect of leadership that, uh, that comes out in the book. I love that. And how have how has your book been received so far? It just got released this summer, so you're a few months past its release. Yeah. What kind of feedback or emails are you receiving? Well, I've been very blessed. I've gotten overwhelmingly positive feedback. There's a you know there's a, a number of really good reviews about it on Amazon that people can go read. Um, I've also just been very thankful. My best friend got married last weekend, and one of the people that was at the wedding came up to me and said, "Hey, I wanted you to know I read your book and I loved it." And, and you know, so I've I've had a number of people in those kind of situations that come up to me and and it's just very encouraging to know that people are being positively impacted by the book. Um, you know, and I've actually, I've done a couple of free giveaways because my goal for the book isn't to make myself money. My goal is to get the book into as many hands as possible. And so I've actually given away, I think at this point upwards of 500 e copies of the book. Um, and given away a whole bunch of paperback ones as well. Cause again, the idea is if it's going to help you, I want you to have it. That's it. I want you to have the book if it's going to help you. I'm not, it, you know, it's, it's sold enough copies to pay for itself. That's really all I was interested in financially from the book. After that, it's really just a matter of if, you know, if, if you need this book, excellent. Here's a copy of it. And, uh, you know, God bless you and I hope it helps you. And if you've read it and you learned something from it, awesome. Either read it again or pass it on to somebody else that needs it. Um, and so I've been very thankful to get positive feedback, encouraging comments, and um, really look forward to seeing other other doors that are going to continue to be open um, by the book. And that's been, uh, that's been really encouraging. 
And you said you're inspired to write a second book. Is it going to be a follow-up on leadership as well or go a different direction? I think, I would say, I think it's going to go a different direction. I've actually, uh, it's funny. Uh, somebody asked me the other day, so do you have an idea for a second book? And I said, I wish I only had an idea for a second book. I have, I have ideas for a second book and a third book and a fourth book. And um, so uh, right now, honestly, I have two or three different ideas that are pinging around in my head. Um, and I haven't decided which one I want to go with yet. One of them would be writing another book about leadership, but based on my high school soccer program, because uh, three years ago, we, um, we had a historically good season. And what I mean by that is we actually, um, we set multiple records for the state of Alabama for high school soccer, uh, especially on the defensive side of the ball. And we went undefeated the entire season until the state championship game. And uh, we, so we ended up going 24 and one. And, um, and so I'd love to write a book called uh, almost perfect. You know, okay. why, why losing one game was better than being undefeated, that sort of thing. Uh, because the thing is we learned a lot more lessons by losing that one game than if we had, because if we had won it, that really opens the door to a lot of complacency. Look what we've done. We're so good. We set all these records. There's nothing left to prove. And instead, you know, we lost that game and I graduated seven wonderful seniors. And the question became, great. So now what do we do? And the answer was we regroup and we try again and we made it all the way back to the state championship game the next year. And we got beat even worse in the state championship game. And so it's just a matter of growing. Uh, another book I've thought about writing has to do with a series of, um, uh, presentations that I'm hoping to give on the topic of kindness. Uh, and so I thought about writing a book about that as well. So just, you know, like I said, multiple ideas. I'm not real sure what I'm going to go with yet. It's, it's great to know that you're still inspired by it. And a lot of the points focus on like uh, a lot of people are afraid of failure mm -hmm. and, and messing up. And I think the point that you brought up is like how that one stands out more than the 24. Yeah. yeah. Because sometimes our largest growth and our ability to develop and learn more about ourselves are in those moments. Oh, absolutely. Um, yeah. So 100% I, I, agree. I, I was curious if you would be able to take out a moment, if there's anything that we had not talked about, a message that you wanted to get across. I wanted to open up a few minutes for you to uh, leave any last uh, words of wisdom or anything you'd like to get across. In addition to that, as a second part, if anyone would like to follow you and, and learn more about you online and maybe that second to 25th book come out in the future, where, <laughs> where could they follow the progress of that story and, and, and all the things you're involved with? So if you would mind, take a few minutes and, and um, leave the audience with those, those last remaining words and how to find you. Yeah, well, thank you for that opportunity. I appreciate it. Um, well, for me, uh, my three main topics that I discuss are leadership, education, and blended or step family life. And for me, the starting point for, for all three of those topics, the common thread is the idea of humility, which is, again, uh, C.S. Lewis defines that as self-forgetfulness. Um, and so when we can approach leadership, or humility, uh, or sorry, or education, or or blended family life from the pro from the question of what can I do to serve other people? That makes everything else easier because it takes my ego, it takes my ego out of it. And the the foundation for all of that for me uh, as a Christian, it comes from the gospel. It comes from knowing that I believe that Christ died for me, literally gave up everything he had for me. And if he's willing to do that, I need to be willing to do that for other people as well. Um, and so I appreciate the opportunity to share that. Um, if people want to uh, learn more about me uh, or, or come find me, they can follow me on Twitter. Uh, my handle is at Real Life Leading. Uh, you can find me on LinkedIn, uh, just Joel Hallbaker. You can find me on Facebook at Joel W. Hallbaker or Facebook.com slash Real Life Leading. Uh, again, the website is reallifeleading.com. And um, I would love to hear from anybody in your, uh, in your audience. I'd love to um, be able to help them if I can. Um, you know, if anybody's interested in the books or the, e the, the book or the ebook, you can find those on Amazon. Uh, they're pretty inexpensive. And, um, you know, again, I'm, I'm grateful for the opportunity to, uh, to share on your show. I appreciate the questions you asked and the, um, it's fun to talk with someone who also has very similar views about parenting and about teaching and about life in general. Um, and I also appreciate that even though we come from different worldviews, different starting points, we can do that respectfully. Like you said, I, I know, uh, just in very brief, I know one of the big problems that a lot of people have with Christianity is that we often, that as Christians, often come across as judgmental or condescending, and um, and 
that's true. <laughs> and so the problem with that is that's our fault. And that's where we need to recognize it as Christians. And we need to, we need to ask forgiveness and move on and try to do things better. So again, I'm, I'm always glad to be able to have conversations with people that even if we don't start from the same place, we have, a, we have some pretty good overlaps if, if we're a Venn diagram there. And uh, it's fun to be able to have those conversations. So thank you very much. And I, I hope that I've been able to, to bring some value to your audience. Hopefully people have learned something that's helpful to them. And, uh, you know, if so, I'd love to hear about it. Well, absolutely. And I also want to thank you for the time that you took out to, to answer the questions and talk about your story. And there's a, a million different directions I, I, I could definitely <laughs> ask you on as well. I mean, having a conversation on religion just in itself could be a whole, a whole podcast. Sure. But one thing that, that, that I'd like to say when you just kind of wrap that up is that uh, one thing that sticks with me that my parents taught me is that regardless of the background that someone comes from, I don't care the color of their skin, I don't care the religion that they have, I don't care their economic status, either people are good people or they're not good people. So if someone has got class and someone is good to you and cares for you, it doesn't matter anything else because you're going to find, you know, bad people or people that want to take advantage from you in every culture, in every yeah. background. You can't just stereotype across the board. Right. And whether it's, whether you get your lessons like you do from religion or you get your lessons on the soccer field, or you get mm -hmm. your lessons on the dojo floor or in the classroom or through a divorce or whatever it may be uh there's the lessons are out there and i right. think that as long as we could learn to uh, going back to religion i'll use the word like preach i think one issue is that people uh haven't experienced themselves whatever it may be and they it's changed their life so much that they mm -hmm. just want to help people right and sometimes by going you have to do this you have to become a vegetarian <laughs> you have to be right. vegan you have to start exercising you have to go to church um right. it sometimes comes with good intention but comes with right. very preachy and yeah. I think when people try to change people too much people's walls go up immediately yep. and i think Agreed. you just have to learn to listen Mm -hmm. and respect and don't necessarily we don't have to get to the same destination by following the same road um we just have to kind of uh, you know appreciate the people along the way and, mm -hmm. and even if we could agree to disagree on topics have respect as a as a fundamental human characteristic and a, and a love for one another knowing that we're going through the same world together yep. trying to accomplish basically the same things and you don't need to take others down and, and right. lift to lift yourself up so i mean that's uh, that's what I got a little bit out of your conversation. So Absolutely. Well, and, and I hope people do go on and, 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 and learn more about you. And I look forward to following, uh, following you on social media and seeing where, where it takes you. And I just wanted to thank you again for your time, um, what you're doing in the classroom and what you're doing uh, with your daughters and on the soccer field is all the reason why I want to do this podcast. It's not just about the celebrities in our world and the famous people in our world that deserve the attention. There's people like you and I that are out there every day in smaller uh, areas of an audience, larger areas, but we're out there every single day trying to do something good, trying to lead by example, try to be that community leader as best you can. Mm -hmm. there's, there's, you know, hopefully lots of people listening that, that have that same role to play. And I love, uh, pointing out that there's so many good people still in this world that are trying to do well. Often you can turn the news on and think that the world's <laughs> falling apart, and right. light, you know, and, 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 and society is lost and there's no good people. And it's just not the, it's not the case. And hopefully one small contribution of the show is to, to highlight some great people that are out there and, and doing good things and, and, and being good human to each other and to their neighbors. So, um, Joel, thank you so much. I really yeah. appreciate the time and uh, yeah. I look forward to, 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 to reading your book and learning more about you. So, thank you. um, yeah, so I look forward to that. Um, best of luck to you and, and to all your future endeavors. And, um, uh, without any further ado, ladies and gentlemen, uh, once again, please go on. I'll leave some show notes. Um, once the uh, podcast uh, posts, uh, obviously, if you're listening to this now, it already has. So take a look at the show notes. All the links to Joel's uh, sites and his books will be posted there. As always, if you have any questions, you could email me, lifesblackbelts at gmail.com, and follow us on social media as well. Every handle is pretty much at Life's Black Belts. Um, but anyway, without any further ado, ladies and gentlemen, today's Life's Black Belt, Mr. Joel Hawbaker. Thank you, sir. Yeah, thank you very much. It's been my pleasure. I appreciate it. Yes, sir.